wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood Good morning. Yeah, happy May Day. Welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. Hard to believe it's May 1st already, you know. And they say in a week or so, the weather will even seem like May 1st. So, <laughs> you know, that'll be good. We have the Voices of Peace leading us in worship today. We're getting into the Word of God today. We've got Holy Communion. And as we begin our worship service, just a few announcements to highlight. We got some anniversaries in the church family. Today, Brad and Laura Keyes are celebrating their anniversary. And also this week, Mike and Amy Brown. And then birthdays. We have three today. Um, Kelsey Dahlman, Mary Stecker, and Nick Ziegler. Um, also this week, Lois Pruitt, Mike Zerbel, Emily Duco, Judy Gazer, Ethel Hillman, Brian Stecker, and Rachel Hillman. So, happy anniversary and happy birthday. <laughs> Sunday school and choir practice today after the service. Crisis response team meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it must be my cologne. <laughs> Ladies spring tea raffle drawings today after the service. Also, National Day of Prayer, Thursday, this Thursday at 12 noon. We're going to have a, about a 25, 30 minute service right here at the church. And we're going to pray about things pertaining to our nation. Also, youth groups going to a Blizzards game on May 20th. Contact Brenda Van Dalwick by May 10th if you plan to attend. Let's look to the Lord, our God, in prayer. And Father, it's wonderful to be able to begin the month with worship, to begin the first day of the week with worship. We dedicate the service to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
We believe that the Bible, consisting of the Old and New Testament, is the only inspired, true, authoritative, written Word of God. We believe that there is one God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God the Father, and ultimately, his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose indwelling power and fullness enables the Christian to live a godly life in this sinful world. We believe that water baptism and the Lord's Supper are sacraments to be observed by the church during this present age. However, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and his abundant grace provide the only basis for the justification and salvation of all who believe. We believe in the sanctity of human life at every stage. We believe in the spiritual unity of all believers in Jesus Christ. We believe in the bodily resurrection of the dead, of the believer to everlasting joy and blessedness with the Lord, of the unbeliever to everlasting conscious punishment. And thank you.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys. How many of you know what this is? By look, just by looking at the box. Yeah, what is this, Abigail? Frosted flakes. What does Tony the Tiger like to say about frosted flakes? What does he usually say about how they taste? Does anybody know? Do they do that anymore with the commercial? I know everybody out there knows what Tony the Tiger says. <laughs> you know what Tony the Tiger says? He says, they're great. And it even says it right here on the box. They're great. I even went on the internet and they talked about the 20 best cereals of all time. Frosted Flakes was number three. Number two was Lucky Charms. And I'm thinking, really? That turns your cereal pink and green and red and all these different colors? The number one cereal was Cinnamon Crunch or something like that. And yeah, that is a good cereal, but I, I, I think Tony should be number one. I, I like Frosted Flakes. But you know, you know what? Jesus also thinks you're pretty great because he went to the cross and died for your sins. And, and he knew that you needed grace and forgiveness, and he loved you. He created you. He thought you were pretty great. And then the disciples got into an argument with, G with themselves, and Jesus heard about it, and he found out that they were arguing about who the greatest is. What did Jesus tell the disciples about how to be great in God's kingdom? He already loves you, but is there anything you can do to be great for God? You remember what he said? He said, helping other people. When you help your parents around the house, Jesus thinks that's pretty great. When you help a friend who's having trouble in school, Jesus thinks that's pretty great. When you help somebody who needs help carrying something in their hands or full, Jesus thinks that's pretty great. We were put here to serve others, just like he came down here to serve us. Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen. And we think Jesus is pretty great. Mark 9, verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not know, want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant and they were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them, taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever, whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Let us pray. And Father, I thank you for these precious scriptures. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. I saw a picture of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, and underneath it, it said, I did this because all lives matter. And because our lives matter to God, most of us want to live lives that matter, lives that make an impact, lives of significance and service to God and to others. How many of you want to hear Jesus say someday, well done, good and faithful servant? How many of you want to hear Jesus say, because you've been faithful in a few things, I'll put you in charge of many things, come and share your master's happiness? Today's Bible reading shows us how we can live lives of significance for the Savior. Let's check it out. Mark chapter 9. In verses 1 through 13, the disciples saw the transfiguration of Christ on the mountain. 
In verses 14 to 29, they saw the triumph of Christ over the demon. And so now the disciples may be expecting to see the exaltation of the Christ, where he conquers the Romans, converts the Pharisees, and shows everybody by a force of strength how great he is. But instead of seeing the exaltation of the Christ, we may be surprised to, to hear about the humiliation of the Christ. In verse 31, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. The disciples are afraid to ask about it because it sounds so scary and sinister and dark and unexpected. But some of us might wonder, why did he say that? Why after the transfiguration of Christ and the triumph of Christ must we be warned about the humiliation of Christ? Because Mark chapter 10 verse 45 says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Lord Jesus Christ demonstrates true greatness, not by the taking of life, but by the giving of his life, paying the price for our sins on the cross, laying it all on the line so that we might be saved, so that we might be free. You may have heard on the news about a week or so ago that Elon Musk bought Twitter for $44 billion. And you know how the national media likes to blow things out of proportion. And so somebody in the media said, Elon Musk lays it all on the line to buy Twitter. Really? Pa I think it was Pastor Ed Young Jr. who said, if my calculations are correct, Elon Musk will still have $200 billion left over after he buys Twitter. I could live off of $200 billion. Could you? <laughs> you know who really laid it all on the line? Jesus Christ. He came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my sins to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. He paid it all. Amen. All to him we owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He had washed it white as snow. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. To him who loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood, so that we may serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Jesus laid it all on the line so that you and I might be reconnected to him and to God. That is the epitome of true greatness in the kingdom of God. But this is lost a little bit on the disciples. They don't get it. You look at verse 33, and it says they came to Capernaum when Jesus was in the house, probably Peter's house, his mother-in-law. Mother he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, they had been arguing about who is the greatest. <laughs> it's kind of funny. John MacArthur says the Lord had just spoken to them about his humiliation, but all they could think about was their exaltation. Maybe they were thinking, well, Jesus just said he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners and he's going to be killed, and we're kind of afraid to ask him about it. We don't really know what he's talking about. But just in case something happens to Jesus... One of us is going to have to take over. So let's decide right now which one of us is the greatest. <laughs> you imagine how ridiculous the conversation might have been. I picture John saying, well, it's going to say in the Bible in about 50 years that I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> so I must be the greatest. And I picture Peter saying, hey, wait a minute. I'm the only one who got an A in Sunday school because I'm the only one who said that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And I was one of the three people that he took with them on the mountain of transfiguration. Therefore, I think you can make a good case that I, Peter, am the greatest. And then I picture Andrew saying, 
You know, Peter, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be here. <laughs> I'm the one who introduced you to Jesus. I'm the one who brought you to Jesus. And considering the significance of that one action, I think you can make a case that I, Andrew, am the greatest. And then I picture Judas saying, well, I don't care what you did. Without money, we're not going to get very far. And Jesus put me in charge of the money. Therefore, I think I am the greatest. Doesn't that sound like Muhammad Ali? I'm the greatest of all times. You know, sometimes, do you think it's possible that we forget that God is the greatest? That Jesus is the greatest? And it's a great honor to serve the great almighty God? Um, speaking of boxing, I was reading about George Foreman, the former heavy, two-time heavyweight boxing champion of the world. He knocked out Joe Frazier in two rounds. He knocked out Ken Norton in two rounds. And he was pretty sure he was going to knock out Muhammad Ali in two rounds. He thought he was indestructible. He was 40-0 and 0 with 37 knockouts. But you know what happened? Muhammad Ali knocked him out. And it devastated his morale and his self-confidence. To this day, George Foreman has a picture on his office wall of him lying on the canvas, knocked out. And one day, a Los Angeles Times reporter said, Well, George, I don't get it. How come you have a picture on your wall of you lying on the canvas, knocked out? And George said, you know, it's a reminder, as a, now that I'm a Christian, to be humble, because the same God who put me down can put me down again. Matthew 23, verse 12, says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know what I think really bothers Jesus? It bothers him that the disciples are preoccupied with greatness rather than the spiritual qualities that lead to greatness. They should have remembered Isaiah 53 verse 12 when God said about Jesus, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Why? Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And maybe the disciples should have remembered a little while earlier in Mark 1, verses 32 and 34, where Jesus stayed up late into the night, healing those who needed healing, ministering to those who needed ministering, delivering those who needed deliverance, showing kingdom greatness, not by lording it over people, but by serving other people. Sacrificial service in the name of God to others is what is considered great in the kingdom of God. But the disciples were arguing about positions of power rather than looking for places of service. So Jesus said, since you haven't been listening to anything I've been saying, let me show you what I'm saying. Verse 35, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone must, wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. The greatest people in God's kingdom are not the prestigious, the powerful, or the privileged. The greatest people are those who have no status at all. The very last, those who live lives of service rather than lives of serve us. The teachers who work hard on their Sunday school lessons and give hours of their time to teach our kids the Word of God, they're the greatest in the kingdom. The teens who raise support and awareness for starving children around the world, they're the greatest in the kingdom. Those who give up a week of their personal vacation from work so that they can minister to kids at Vacation Bible School. They're the greatest in the kingdom. Those who write letters and pray for those who are in prison or on the prayer list, they're the greatest in the kingdom. 
And the kids who come around the pews after the service and pick up all the the cups that are left over from communion just because they want to do one thing to show their love for Jesus, they're the greatest in the kingdom. I read about a man who was watching Mother Teresa clean the wounds of a leper. And he said, ugh, that's gross. I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And she said, neither would I. But I would gladly do it for Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you will be your servant. David Guzik says the desire to be praised and to gain recognition should be foreigner, should be foreign to a follower of Christ. Jesus wants us to embrace last as a choice and even to allow others to be preferred over us. And then Jesus gives us another illustration of what it means to be the last of all and the servant of all. Verse 36 says he took a little child and had him stand among them. You know, that doesn't seem like a big deal, right? I mean, we even have paintings in the church of Jesus holding little kids and interacting with little kids. And we we have a children's sermon here. We take it for granted that Jesus loves children. But in the first century world, children had no rights, no privileges, and nobody to vouch for them. It wasn't considered a big deal at all if a parent couldn't afford to provide for their children to just leave them and go away. As cruel and heartless and unbelievable as that is, that sort of thing happened in the ancient world. Sometimes they even sold their kids into slavery because they had no way of providing for them. And in the Jewish culture, it was considered a lot of times a waste of time to have a conversation with a child 12 years old or under. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ was 12 years old when he was interacting with the teachers of the law in the temple in Luke chapter 2. But what is amazing about this reading is that Jesus doesn't think children are a waste of time. In fact, he took the child in his arms. That shows us that Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And this is a lesson that the disciples still don't get, because when you get to the next chapter, Mark chapter 10, verse 13, people realize that Jesus loves the little children, and they start bringing their kids to Jesus to have him bless them. And the disciples are like, get him out of here. This isn't Romper Room. This isn't Sesame Street. This isn't Captain Kangaroo. I'm dating myself. You know, we're not into this stuff. We're into theological seminary type stuff. And Jesus is like, man, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then Jesus says, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name, it's not a waste of time. They're welcoming me. And whoever welcomes me doesn't welcome me, but the one who sent me. Some of the greatest people in God's kingdom are those who minister to children in Jesus' name. Those who work at Vacation Bible School, parents who provide a foster home for children, adults who open their homes for youth ministry, Those of you who talk to kids after church and say, I'm so glad you're here. Jesus loves you so much. Those who teach, those who do devotions with their kids, those who not only drop their kids off at church, but stay with their kids in church and learn about Jesus together with their kids in church. And those who work at a ministry like Vita Ministries in Appleton, helping young moms know what to do when their toddler throws a temper tantrum, helping young moms decide whether or not to keep their baby or give their baby up for adoption, helping single dads who are clueless about raising children, giving them the skills and the wisdom and the tools to be the best dad they can be. All those who minister to children, even those who give financially and that's all they do. Children who are a 
People who are a blessing to children are a blessing to Jesus. Dr. James Edwards, in his commentary on Mark, says Christ often comes to us in the lives of the small, the insignificant, and the powerless. And when we treat them well, we're treating Jesus well. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 40, whatever you do for the least of these brothers of mine, you do it for me. Richard D. Hahn from Radio Bible Class Ministries says true greatness does not strive, does not lie with those who strive for worldly fame. It is with those who serve in Jesus' name. That's what it means to live a life of significance for Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. If you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're already active and involved in a ministry in the church or outside the church or in another church, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving the Lord and his people. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Revelation 2, 3, Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. My only word of admonition to you is do not forsake your first love. Do not stop loving Jesus, loving the word of God, and loving prayer. And if you're here today, and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, but you're not actively involved in ministry in the church or outside the church because you're not sure what God's will for your life is, I want to encourage you that there are things that you can do to serve the Lord while you wait for a word from the Lord. Saturday, June 25th, we need help right here at the church. We're going to have an electronic recycling event from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. If you got a couple hours of time that you can help us out, that's a great way to serve God and God's people. Tara Bruckner's getting some people together to do decorations and preparations for Vacation Bible School come up, coming up in July. If you're not sure you're ready to teach a room full of kids, this is another way you can help out is the preparations and the decorations. And we have this thing coming up in August that's called Gospel Fest. We need people who can help set up on Thursday night of Gospel Fest, leading up to Gospel Fest, and those who can take down on Sunday morning after Gospel Fest and after the worship service. Those who serve Jesus right where they're at and don't just sit around hoping for some future word from Jesus. They're a blessing to Jesus and to the kingdom of God. And if you're here today and you've been worshiping with us, you've been watching worship online with us, but you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the thing that I want most of all. I want to see you there. I want to, I want to see you be in relationship with God. We live for that here at Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. I want this to be the day, May Day, May 1st, 2022, where you repent of your sins and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be wonderfully born again. And then you can seek God about using your time and your talents and your treasures to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen.
Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come before the throne of grace. We want to pray for those who have medical procedures coming up, those who have surgeries or exploratory tests. We pray that they would find comfort and courage in Christ. We also want to praise you for those who've experienced healing in the last week, those who have had viral infections and they made it through be, because you brought healing into their lives. We thank you and praise you. We also pray for those who are fighting cancer. We pray for Lori Newshart to have victory over cancer in the name of Jesus. We pray for Andy Furman as he had heart transplant surgery. And we pray, Lord, his body continues to receive his new heart and that he would grow stronger and stronger each day and give all the glory to you and turn his heart both physically and spiritually over to you and your lordship. And Lord, we also pray for our world. There are so many things going on in the world, the, the war in Ukraine and on economic trouble and inflation and you go to the store and your eyes almost pop out of your head at how much more things are costing and it's taxing on many families. Um, God, these are, we're entering into some difficult times right now. So just want to pray for the nation. We pray for the people of Peace Church and the surrounding churches. Help us to find our strength and our comfort and our security, not in our savings account, but in the Savior, to find our hope and trust and in you, O oh Lord. We also pray for the President, the Congress, and the courts to make wise choices. We pray you would raise up people who will make wise choices if the ones who are in there are not doing so. And we pray that regardless of who's in there, that you would reign sovereignly over the kingdoms of men. We also pray for all those in ministries of service, for teachers and Sunday school teachers, doctors, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants and nurses, EMTs and paramedics and firefighters, law enforcement, pastors, evangelists, and we pray for our military. Watch over all those who watch over us. And most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus himself, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we'll take up the morning offering.
Islands. Father, thank you for these gifts. Help us to use them wisely for ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. This table is open to all who confess Jesus as the Christ and seek to follow Christ's way. In Luke's gospel, we read that Jesus at the table with two of the disciples took bread and blessed and broke it. When he gave it to them, their eyes were open and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read that the church was gathered often in the homes of believers. They devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Jesus, the bread of life, we gather at your table to know you in the breaking of the bread. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give God thanks and praise. Holy God, we praise and bless you for creation, for the life you have given to us, and for your dying love. We thank you for revealing your will for us, in the giving of the law, and in the preaching of the prophets. We thank you especially that in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, born of Mary, to live in our midst. of your glory, O God most high. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Consecrate, therefore, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine, and bless us that receive them at this table, that we may offer you our faith and praise, that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and that we may continue faithful in all things. In the strength Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and give thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. Come, for all things are ready. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Let us partake together. This is the blood of Christ, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us partake together. Let's pray the prayer of thanksgiving found upon the screen. We thank you, almighty, everlasting God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all of Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and help us to praise you with our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.
Let us stand. Thank you. Thank you for worshiping the Lord with us on this day. I want to leave you with these words of encouragement. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the weekend. They've got the raffle thing going on from the women's tea that you can still buy a ticket for and go in peace. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood.